Good afternoon. My name is Dante Michaud, and I have the honor of serving as the uh, Director of Programs at Cave Canem. I want to begin by inviting you all to use your imaginations and, for some of you, your mobility. We are not in Seattle, in the brand new sparkle of concrete and glass. We are in Harlem, at the turn of the millennium, in someone's home. One of the greatest writers in the history of our language is about to read from her latest work, Space is Limited, and you want a good seat. So please come forward from the back and the margins of this room. We are among friends and luminaries and grateful to be in close proximity. <clears throat> Let us acknowledge that the city of Seattle and its green spaces are on stolen Coast Salish land, specifically the ancestral land of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the Stilaguamish and the Muckleshoot people. We recognize the stewardship of Seattle's green spaces by the Coast Salish people since time immemorial and the disruption of this work by colonialization. Cave Canem is a nonprofit organization committed to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of black poets. Founded by artist Cornelius Eady and Toy Derricott, four artists in 1996, Cave Canem fosters community across the diaspora to enrich the field by facilitating a nurturing space to learn, experiment, create, and present. We are so pleased to be presenting Duende and the Harlem Art Salon at AWP to highlight and celebrate the literary and cultural work of Margaret Porter and Quincy Troop. In 2004, the successful San Diego art gallerist, Margaret Porter Troop, returned to Harlem with her husband, the award-winning poet Quincy Troop, inviting their extensive international circle of friends as featured guests. Margaret opened their historic apartment with its sumptuous collection of art to the public, creating perhaps the most exciting gathering of writers and artists since the Stein siblings in early 20th century Paris. Those lucky, fortunate enough to have gained entrance would have found themselves under the voices of Hugh Masekela, Rachel Eliza Griffiths, Ishmael Reed, Maurice Conde, ta Coates, or the grandee herself, Toni Morrison. Margaret and I will discuss the history and the sinishers of the salon, and she will introduce its guest of honor, her husband, the poet Quincy Troop. Margaret Porter Troop is a writer, editor, curator, and the founding director of the Gloucester Arts Project, a multidisciplinary arts camp for youth without access to the arts, and the Harlem Arts Salon, a series of talks, book signings, performances, and exhibitions established in the tradition of the Salons of the Harlem Renaissance, which provides a forum for artists, especially of African descent, to meet and commune with their audience. Please welcome Margaret Porter Troop. So it's really a great honor uh, for me to be sitting here talking with you. Um, one of the great lessons I learned um, from a woman named Hetty Jones, who some of you might know, uh, is the important role that um, women in particular have played in uh, establishing the arts, particularly from the black arts movement until now. And I remember being a young college student and hearing about the Harlem Art Salon. <laughs> it was uh, legendary and I always dreamed of going and I never got to go. But um, Margaret and Quincy were so, uh, lovely to have me in their home where I could see where all of these wonderful events um, have uh, uh, taken place. And so um, we're just going to have a conversation about uh, that exciting thing. And Margaret, you can start, or if you would start by telling us a little bit about how you envisioned this and came up with the idea in, in its inception. I um, started out um, 
It all started out after I had come back from San Diego where I'd uh, operated a gallery uh, for uh, 13 years, a contemporary art gallery, and we had decided, Quincy and I, that we were moving back to our apartment in New York City in Harlem. And uh, I knew that I could not have a contemporary art gallery in New York mm. because of the cost and all of that. So uh, thinking about it as a place uh, that was a platform for writers and artists, which is what was behind every, every venture that I got involved in, was to, to build a platform, to offer a platform to artists and writers of color in particular because they didn't have as access to uh, lots of, uh, quote, mainstream venues at that time. Uh, and so um, uh, I... Uh, thought, let's do it in our apartment because <laughs> we have a fabulous apartment. Yes, it's a do. turn of the century building that was built in 1896 by the Astor family as a country residence for the wealthy on Wall Street. The wealthy mm. people who lived on Wall Street could go up to the countryside and have a, uh, a nice apartment, an apartment living uh, uptown in the country. Harlem was a country <laughs> then in 1896. And, um, it was a, it's a natural salon space. It's, a, in fact, a, the corner where we are located has Zora Neale Hurston's name. I don't know if you noticed yeah. that. Mm -hmm. At 116th Street and Adam, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, uh, Zora Neale Hurston's name's on the street sign because she lived in our building. Our building is a historic building. And so following the tradition of uh, 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 Alelia Walker and, uh, and uh, the people in the, Har in the uh, Harlem Renaissance and others, um, it seemed appropriate to have, uh, to continue the work that I was doing with the Contemporary Art Gallery, which also offered multidisciplinary programming. We had, uh, we had film, uh, symposia, we had um, talks, poetry readings, musical performances, and all of this. I learned how to do all of this after meeting Quincy. <laughs> I met Quincy in 1977 in New York City. And at that time, he was at the center of all things cultural, <laughs> music, literature, everything. Quincy was one of the driving forces in terms of producing events and providing a platform for artists uh, to have their works heard and seen and listened to. And so uh, he was actually my mentor, <laughs> as well as my eventual husband of over 40 some years. Mm -hmm. uh, but he taught me everything I know about doing uh, production, cultural events, producing mm -hmm. cultural events, and being a cultural activist is, I think, what I would consider myself mm -hmm. as. Um, he taught me about how to do it, how to, how to program, and what to think about in terms of programming, how to get, as he said, acid, put asses in the seats and all of that. <laughs> and uh, uh, we had created a very dynamic scene in San Diego. Um, and so I wanted to translate that uh, to New York, to our apartment, to our space. And because we had the space to lower the overhead, mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And I decided to do books because it was, at the time that I started, I got some support from publishers who would uh, underwrite some of the events. I don't know, you know the format of the Harlem Art Salon. Yeah. Uh, we would have uh, a guest artist and people to control the number of people who were able to come. Uh, we would uh, have an admission and that admission would give uh, attendees a copy of whatever publication, if it's a CD or book or whatever it was, they would get a copy, complimentary copy as part of their admission cost and food, home cooked meal. As you can that, see on uh, the screen. <laughs> that I prepared <laughs> myself. So um, that's how it started. Thank you for, for giving us a little bit of that history. It's interesting that you say uh, you learned all of this programming from Quincy about putting on these events, particularly in your work on the West Coast. Um, do you think of yourself as a sort of cultural empresario? Uh, well, you, you told me that when I met you. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to thank you for giving me that word because I don't know what I am. <laughs> Just, um, I love... Um, I love artists, mm. I love the arts, I love culture, and I think it's so important. I think it's the most important thing that we can do because I think that 
it promotes civility, mm. you know? Mm. And I think we need that a lot these days, more than ever. Um, uh, enrichment, nourishment, honor, mm. you know, recognition, paying tribute to the, all the hard work, all the labor, all the beautiful writing and, and all the beautiful music and everything that our artists produce. Yeah. I am so an amateur of artists because I think it takes a lot of courage to be an artist, especially in this society. And I think that um, there's no greater honor for me than to work to make sure that that work gets published or gets seen or get whatever. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I know that there are hundreds of people who are grateful for the work that you've been doing, if not thousands. Um, and I. It's interesting to me that the cultural work that you do, that you've done as an individual, um, is also a kind of art form. Yes. So I think you are an artist and you are courageous for having put this on and, you know, let's just face it, not many people would allow all those strangers in their <laughs> home, you know. And yes. not only did you allow them in your home, you cooked uh, for them. M Margaret is a fantastic cook, um, I hope one day you'll be able to sample some of the food. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I think that's a, uh, an interesting sort of segue to talk about food and uh, black culture and its relationship to art. Um, when you were thinking about the people who would be in your home, not only the guests of honor, but also maybe some veteran people who had attended more than one salon, and you were coming up with your menus, um, what kind of thinking went into it? Were you, were you going into it pragmatically, thinking what can I make the most of in the quickest amount of time? Or were you feeling your full culinary self, thinking how am I going to dazzle these people with a dish that they never, <laughs> they've never well, had? I, I think it was a combination of both. I chose to do things that, would, that could feed a crowd. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I tried to make beautiful presentations of the food and that it's tasty, that it's, um, you know, you have to consider all kinds of allergies and things like that. And so all of that, um, all of that goes into the thinking of it. But the most important thing is that I was inspired to do this by uh, my mentors, Vertime Grovner, mm -hmm. and uh, who, who described herself as a culinary anthropologist. Mm -hmm. She taught me everything I know about food cooking, presenting, entertaining, everything like this. She was tops. Yeah. She was such a phenomenal cook, but she also was an artist in the way she presented food and all of that. So I tried to model after her and also uh, Amina Baraka. Okay. Amina Baraka and Verda May were like the best in terms <laughs> of uh, food and everything and party. And so I wanted it to be a cultural event, but I wanted it to be a party kind of a celebratory event and something where people, when they came, that they would see other people like them, meet new people like them, share, and just have a sort of communal type experience mm -hmm. around, you yeah. know, uh, an event like Were there any obstacles to you providing this platform for artists? Woo. Well, the first obstacle, when I gave my first show, I mean my first event, my first salon with uh, Hugh Masekela, the elevator broke down. Oh no. It was in the summer. It was 90 degrees outside and I live on the seventh floor and didn't have air conditioning. Oh, no. So <laughs> living in an old building that did not uh, accommodate a lot of weight mm -hmm. well, was always an obstacle. When Toni Morrison came, I was worried about security because uh, the event sold out in one a day mm. and I had over 100 people in my apartment. Yes. So I had to hire security for that and um, I didn't really, you know that in our apartment we have a lot of artwork and, yes. and, and collectibles and everything. I never really worried about that too much, about people uh, breaking yeah. or doing things like that. I always tried to arrange the place so that that didn't happen. But it's, uh, it's an apartment and so I have neighbors. Yeah. So I had to <laughs> always be considerate of the fact that my neighbors might not appreciate 
all this wonderful work I was doing. You didn't give them freebies to say you could come over and you don't have didn't to Didn't have the uh, foresight <laughs> to do that. I mean, it, it, is a, it is a magnificent apartment. I mean, the fact that it is an apartment in New York City that can accommodate an audience of 100 people gives you some idea of its floor plan, let's say. Um, and it feels very much, um, and I hope you can see in some of the, the photographs that are on the screens, it feels very much like you are in someone's home, and um, I hope that you all have had the, the, the privilege of being able to see really great art in domestic spaces, not in the sort of sanitized museum, um, to see uh, paintings and, and collages uh, next to first edition books. Um, there's a, a fantastic book collection. And uh, to see the table laden with food and all of those things happening at the same time. And uh, the, the image that we just saw just before this one, you, the, the, the people who came and who were just audience members, for example, the picture that's just there, I can see, I think, Patricia Spears Jones sitting in the center mm -hmm. of uh, the room and, and uh, Michael White was in, in one of the photographs. And so to see uh, all of the confluence of that is a very powerful cultural moment. And this was happening, I don't know, how often would you say you had the salons? In the beginning, I had a salon twice a month. Um, I did not have a regular schedule. I like not having a red regular schedule because mm. I didn't want to be obligated to. Sure. And it's my home as well. So uh, that allowed me to do it whenever I felt like doing it. And I tried to do it when there was a book, new book being issued mm -hmm. or something like that, a new record release or something like that to promote uh, that, yeah. that, uh, and, that product. And uh, I think, um, I don't think anyone would be uh, upset if you if you describe to us what you think your most successful salon was? Uh, in terms, I, I think the most successful one, without a doubt, was Toni Morrison. It was the most successful in that I was so honored that she said yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I had met her when I met Quincy in 1977 or 78. I met her. Uh, she had sublet his apartment and uh, I got to meet her. And she was always very, very, very kind to me. And when I had my gallery, she supported the gallery. Mm -hmm. She bought artwork. And any time that I called her or spoke to her, she was extraordinarily kind. Mm -hmm. So one day, I was sitting there thinking, like, I was like, really, even though she was so nice to me, I was really in awe of her. Mm -hmm. And I uh, called her up on the phone. And I said, uh, Tony, would you do a salon? And she said, of course. <laughs> so that was great. Yeah. And I was like walking on, on cloud nine for, uh, for the whole time. But we had so many people. I had to install video, video uh, screens in mm. several rooms uh, and everything. And it's just, it was uh, jam packed. <laughs> and, uh, it but it was magnificent. You know, I had yeah. Ishmael Reed, Toni Morrison, Quincy was the moderator, and everybody came. Mm. John Wyman, uh, Alison Hitchcock came all the way. <laughs> Did she come all the way for you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mildred Howard, the uh, artist, uh, she's a, a visual artist from Berkeley. She came and cooked, and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Do you Tony remember was... what the menu was? No, I don't oh, remember God. what the menu was. Uh, I don't remember, no. I'm always <laughs> interested in food, and I think um, I, because Tony was such a phenomenal cook herself, um, I wondered uh, if if she had like any special requests that she said, "I'm going to come, but I'd like for you to." Make no, this I thing don't. Again. I don't think she did. She was yeah. very. She was very accommodating. Uh, we had. Uh, we gave her a private lunch before the the group came because you know it was uh, going to be a long day. It was going to be a long yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, you can see the sheer numbers of people packed into the and packed into these rooms, and the rooms are large, spacious mm -hmm, rooms. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I wonder if you might talk a little bit um, as well about the art collection that you have and, and its relationship to some of the writers who are in your so social circle. Well, well, uh, so I 
started collecting after I met Quincy. Quincy's a collector. He collects books, wine. Mm -hmm. Used to collect women, but I don't think he does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, books, music, uh, wines, uh, everything. He's a collector. Uh, and, good spirits. And art, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so when I met him, I didn't know. I, did, I, wasn't, I wanted to be an actor, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, but uh, uh, I met him, and, and he collected art. So I was like, oh, I want to know this guy he has original <laughs> art in his apartment. Whoa. So um, we, I started, uh, before we moved to California, started having little weekend art exhibitions in our apartment. Mm -hmm. One of our friends, Monique Kleska, who's Haitian, uh, said to me, Margaret, in this beautiful apartment, why don't we give a show? <laughs> and I said, okay. And so we had this show of Haitian tapestries from wow. Haitian mountain women. And we had Quincy's Rolodex, which was a, uh, a phone book like this, you know, mm -hmm. that was like this thick, had yeah. everybody's name. It was like so big. So we went through his phone, invited everybody. They came, we sold everything, mm -hmm. and we had a fabulous party. Wonderful. So I was like, oh, I want to do this. I was working at the New York Times at the time in mm -hmm. corporate, in advertising, and I'm not that yeah, girl. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was not happy there. Uh, I had some interesting and memorable experiences at the New York Times, mm -hmm. but uh, corporate was not quite the right fit. Right. So uh, when I started doing these weekend things, uh, our apartment became like the center for people who came through, mm -hmm. artists, and of course, Quincy being uh, um, uh, an artistic director for the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center. He did mm -hmm. the Black Roots Festival for 20 some years, yeah. where he would invite writers and musicians and, 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 and stage this event once a year. Uh, he knew everybody, everybody, everybody. And so people would come through town on their way somewhere else and we'd have something for them in the apartment. Mm. Uh, you know, facilitating networking for artists who are emerging and uh, providing that kind of support. Um, so I forgot what I was talking about. That's right, you were just telling us about how the art collection... <laughs> yeah, so you. then uh, I started doing that with the art and uh, I loved it, I loved it, I loved it. I used to come home from work and I would look at the collection that we had amassed before I had a gallery and it would just elevate my whole spirit. I would mm. just like... I have to do this. So when we went to uh, uh, San Diego, uh, I opened an art gallery and I ran a contemporary art gallery for 13 years. Wow. That for me was my most important work to, the, to date because it proved to me that a little girl from Mississippi, from the woods, from <laughs> the you know yeah. outskirts of where, uh, nowhere, uh, could open a contemporary art gallery and have it respected as among one of the best mm -hmm. in the area, in the, in the West Coast, in the United States, because it was multicultural. And at the time that I opened it, there was not a lot of mixing artists of different races together. Right. And so I would show artists from everywhere. I showed artists from Italy, Asia, uh, uh, Caribbean, uh, everywhere. Right. Africa, United States, black, white, whatever. I would show all of this, you know. So that creates a very dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, so this is exactly why I call you a cultural impresario. I mean, you don't see it, but you've said you worked for the New York Times, you opened your own art gallery, you ran one of the greatest literary salons in our history. You also have founded, after the Harlem Art Salon, the Gloucester Arts Project, which is providing arts to kids in the woods, as you've just described. Yeah. And that, that is all the makeup of a, of a cultural impresario. Yes. You, you well, I come from a family of, uh, of people like that. My people built our church. My great-grandfather great built the church in our community and mm. the school. Mm. So it's kind of a, in the family tradition to be a teacher or something like this. Yeah. So I think I've kind of, I couldn't teach because yeah. I don't have uh, the patience for teaching myself personally, mm -hmm. but I do value education more than anything. I think it's so, so very important and I'm very worried about public education in this country. Are we all? <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, it's something we really need to get extraordinarily active about because uh, 
I don't know what's going to happen to us if we don't. Uh, so I started the Gloucester Arts Project. One, one day, I walked into the gallery. I walked into the gallery. I saw how beautiful it was. I was stunned. I had the most magnificent uh, exhibition of Mario Staccioli. Mario Sta Mauro Staccioli is an Italian sculptor. He mm -hmm. made these gigantic uh, geometric uh, uh, sculptures and they were in the gallery. And the gallery was very spacious. I walked in there and it was like stunning. I was like, wow, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought about myself as that little girl in Mississippi who used to dream about traveling. I wanted to travel. I wanted to be in the world, I wanted to go. And I said, you know what? I'm so happy at this moment. I need to make sure that other little Margarets in other places like I grew up can also know that they can yeah. realize their dreams. You That's know magnificent. And you have done extensive traveling, you and Quincy. Uh, yes. And um, all over the world, really, yes. and, and still continuing to do so. <laughs> and when you, uh, during the years of the Harlem Arts Salon, when you were not having the salons and you were traveling and you were in Europe and the Caribbean, and um, were you meeting artists who maybe eventually came through to the salon? Uh, you know, I don't know if I did. I, like a lot of the people I had, for example, Hugh Masekela was a long time, very close friend of Quincy's. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote his autobiography, I had the salon, naturally, give him a party. Madre right. um, um, Conde, I met in New York because she was she teaching at Columbia, Columbia, you yeah. know, and uh, uh, Randy Weston, I met not from traveling, he was in New York. Ron Carter, they wrote to me and said, look, Ron has a book, do you mind having a salon with Ron Carter? Uh, so no, I don't think I met I've had people in the salon who I've met during my travels, mm -hmm. but certainly in the gallery, when I had the gallery and ex exhibiting artists that I met uh, and, abroad. And I, I, you mentioned Maurice Condé there, and one of the earlier images that we saw is of um, Maurice Condé and also Derek Walcott, who I know used to come and, yes. you know. Yes. Sleep yes. in your apartment yes. when he was traveling. Yes. And so um, that, wasn't, that wasn't a salon. You were inviting people into the space to do workshops with those Yes, writers. I invited yeah. him to do a workshop uh, before I had a salon, and that was like 1983. Oh, wow. Uh, I started out in 1983. So when I met Quincy, and we, we became a couple, he was teaching workshops uh, uh, after his uh, gig at the, at, the, at the College of Staten Island. He would come out and he would teach workshops for the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center. And I would sit in on his workshops and uh, the workshop people, I was, I'm a very mean critic, you know what I mean? I'm just <laughs> like so mean. And so the lady, one of the writers said to me, well, where's your stuff? You know so much about writing. Where's your work? So I started writing, too, mm -hmm. uh, sitting in, auditing uh, his workshops. I started writing a bit. And so uh, a woman named Geraldine Wilson, who's since died, all of these people are dead now, and I and um, Anasa Jordan started something called New Bones. Mm -hmm. And we would go around doing readings. Wow. We, would, we would read all over Manhattan, and we would uh, invite writers and artists to come and read, and musicians following Quincy's example with the uh, Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center. Uh, so uh, I had started doing that in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to California, you know, I started the gallery. And in California, I also started an after-school program for kids. Right. In, so you were an yeah, old hand yeah. at this when yeah. you started the Gloucester yeah. Project. Yeah, and, uh, and so then when we came back to New York, I started the salon and also uh, the Gloucester Arts Project for the kids in rural yeah. Mississippi Amazing. or wherever they may be. Yeah. Well, the history of this salon is something that um, I hope uh, a program like this will uh, bring more attention to it and that the, the writers that went through and the dates and the times and some of the audience members, that, that that information will be archived so that we don't lose it. And I know that in 50 and 100 years, people will speak about Margaret Porter Troop as they speak about Alalia <laughs> Walker. Um, 
And so uh, now I would like to uh, invite you to do what you did all those years during the salon and introduce our guest of honor. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. I wanted to thank you so much for honoring the work that I've done Absolutely. with the salon. I really appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you for inviting Absolutely. me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wrote, a, um, I wrote an introduction for Quincy. I wrote, I wrote an introduction for Quincy because his work has spanned over 50 years and he's done so much. So I'm going to take my time to read this uh, biography of Quincy Troop that I wrote. Born July 22, 1939, in St. Louis, Missouri. Quincy Troop is the eldest son of the late Quincy T. Troupe Sr., who added an extra P in his last name to mimic the Spanish pronunciation of it, and Dorothy Marshall. His father, an amateur boxer and videographer, was a catcher and player manager in the Negro Leagues. More than likely, the footage you may have seen in documentaries about the Negro Leagues was shot by Mr. Troupe Sr. His mother was a receptionist at Famous and Bar department store in St. Louis. Famous and Bar was once a division of Macy's back in the day. In addition to being a father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, husband, art collector, wine connoisseur, Quincy is an award-winning poet, writer, biographer, editor, educator, performer, producer, artistic director, lifelong advocate for literature and the arts, and author of 21 books, including 11 volumes of poetry, Duende Poems, 1966 to now, is his most recently published work, long listed for the 2022 National Book Award. Three children's books, six non-fiction works, including James Baldwin, The Legacy, Miles, The Autobiography, The Pursuit of Happiness, a 40-week New York Times bestseller that became a major motion picture with Will Smith, Earl the Pearl Monroe, about New York Knicks basketball legend, and he's published five CDs. His numerous essays, articles, interviews have been published in the Village Voice, New York Times Magazine, Spin Magazine, Essence Magazine, Emerge Magazine, the Long Island Weekly, as well as part of international art exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale in 1997, uh, Robert Cole Scott's installation, in the permanent collection, in the permanent installation also of Mildred Howard's uh, uh, Blue Bridge in San Francisco and Curiosity, uh, an installation at the San Leandro Public Library at the Point Loma Wastewater Management Project with musician George Lewis and visual artist Matthew Gregoire in Point Loma, New York, uh, Point Loma, California. He also has many academic and professional honors. He has two American Book Awards. He has Patterson Award for Sustained Literary Achievement, Poets and Writers, Writers for Writers Award, Peabody Award for the Miles Davis Radio Project, Milt Kessler Award for Poetry, Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award from Furious Flower, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History Award, Rupert Costa Medal in American Indian Affairs presented by Allison Hedgecoke and Dr. Clifford Trafzer. California, he was California's first poet laureate and he was inducted into the Black Writers Hall of Fame at Chicago State University. Quincy has been the editor of seven publications including the Watts Writers Anthology, Giant Talk, an anthology of third world literature, American Rag, Code, the Green, Black Renaissance Noir, and the online publications, The Gathering of the Tribes and Conch, and he's a contributing editor of Conjunctions Magazine, edited by Bradford Morrow. He's, he was an educator for 35 years and taught creative writing, African and Caribbean literature at UCLA, 
USC, Ohio University, Chicago of Staten Island, uh, College of Staten Island, uh, at the City University of New York, University of Ghana, and Lagos University, Columbia University, University Graduate School of Writing, and he is Professor Emeritus of the University of California, San Diego. He was artistic director at the Black Roots Festival of the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center for 26 years. He was the artistic director of the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego's Artist on the Cutting Edge for 11 years and of the San Diego Museum of Art Intersections for two years. Some praise for Quincy Troop's work. He combines mere words into phrases and paragraphs that sing the range of life's raw emotions, Los Angeles Times. Troop is an innovator of form and tone who shifts quickly from a lofty LGA mode into burlesque or smoky jazz-downed pop phraseology, publishes weekly. Troop's poems are exuberant and passionate, an outpouring, uh, excuse me, Troop's poems are exuberant and passionate outpourings with driving syncopated rhythms and improvisatory riffs of colorful language, Star Tribune. The typical Troop poem comes at the reader like a locomotive on fire, full of blazing and powerful imagery, Ishmael Reed for the San Diego Reader. Quincy Troop writes a poetry for the ears, heart, and the whole body, Al Young. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce my husband, Quincy Troop. <laughs> How y'all doing? Okay. This book is going to be a movie. Uh, my book, Miles and Me. And uh, I wrote the screenplay. It should be out, I hope, next year. Okay? That's why I brought it up. Dark clouds blooming up ahead. Dark clouds blooming up ahead over a small town in Heartland America. Blocks out the sun as lightning cracks boom across space. As red MAGA cap wearing white men gather. Circle around in a car, menacing a black family anywhere in rural USA. Beneath the sky, a symphony of thunder. Midday claps of slashing swords, flash jagged fields, aqua green, aqua green summer grass, crisscrossing highways ever which away. How some ever you look in front of you out here, where grass has flattened like manes atop lions' heads. Right before their golden eyes blaze, their nostrils flare, and history pulls the trigger of primordial instinct. And they attack without remorse, far away from asphalt. A waiting sign, a warning sign, a metaphor, if you wish, of what this poem searches for here in America. A clue, 
a predilection of what's ahead as it winds its way through curving questions, hooked and sprouting tails at the bottom, at the bottom of human savagery, a hunger so deep in the psyche of human sa 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 savagery, a hunger so deep in the psyche of human darkness. Aggravating mysterious impulses beneath spinning wheels in a funeral light, omens bright as a flashlight. Perhaps a philosophy of coffins heading west in proce processions of hearse, snaking like ants, they flicker, then quit, quit in the blink of an eye. A swirling black dervish resembling an elephant trunk drops down, howling out of the sky, out of the sky in front of you. And it is a surprise much louder than the last scream you feared you heard before it quickly thrashed around you. Like what you thought death might be in the center of truth. Like life you no longer recognize, coming straight at you. And you are bleeding, pleading once again to your maker to please let you survive this moment of peril, this madness all around you. The roll of seven, this middle finger in the dice game of life. And you are spared once again, dealt a winning hand. So you thank God, the creator, for the umpteenth town, time in your up and down stock market roller coaster life, just as sin now creeps back into your brain once again. I'm sorry it was so dark, but we live in dark times. These are very, very dark times. And if you don't think so, all you got to do is look around. I don't like it either. You know, I want to be happy. I want to be happy and, you know, and see things in another way. But that's not the way it is. It's not the way it is. So I didn't come here to read happy poems. You know, I didn't come here to read happy poems. People are leaving, see, because they don't want to hear nothing. That's dark. <laughs> That's cool. I write these forms. I like to tray around and invent new forms. So this is one called the new 7-Elevens in rhyme. And the whole thing about this is I wrote these al I write these alternating poems that are seven, seven syllables and seven lines and 11 syllables and 11 lines. So it's my own form, you know. And so I'm going to read you a couple of those. This is a seven. There it goes. Seven. Train wheels spin over steel tracks in voices of moaning, deep blues wailing through the air. You think you feel paths of history as bad news, carrying tales of skulls crunched under heels when humans refuse to see greed as warning. War is clues to kill with zeal. This is an 11. In New York City during winter, blanketing white snow is transformed to dirt black sorrow. When days carry blues into singing, plaintive through, though, through people who track voices like wheels spinning on ice or grinding syllables, whining of rat packs, clawing nights through garbage cans, chase air freezing above it all. A man hacks clawing nights through garbage cans, clothes air freezing above it all. A man hacks, spits out a trumpet blast from somewhere, cooing sounds of lovebirds, in the sack, woo, up in Harlem, wind is a razor 
slashing. Usain, thank you. Usain Bolt, remember, you remember Usain Bolt? Huh? I, he, he stunned me when I first saw him. He was running so fast. So, and I, I don't usually write, write any poems about track stars or anything, but I'm going to read you a couple of stanzas of, of this poem. One. A lightning boat unzips the black night sky, looking like a miracle zigzagging through space. Inside ether, flying at an unworldly pace, we can't imagine in dream. A human zipping past our eyes this fast. But there went Usain Bolt, seducing us with sheer propulsion urging his body forward at, to reach immortality through speed, drew our attention to him. Metal to magnet, bees to honey, locked our syllables onto his very high-stepping move. Whenever, whenever, whatever boat did from this moment on, running track was special. Despite his playfulness, serious aura, the chameleon, mysterious, deep magic of his nature pulled us to gawk whenever he put on display his prowess. Otherworldly dominance, exuding complete control over incredible power. The bullet like, the bullet like, the bullet like thrust, powering his lean, tall, Jamaican's road runner body, long legs wheeling as he sprinted, lean, dipped into curves, piston legs pumping hard and fast down a track, while the other hapless racers, also known as speed demon, though not as quick, strained to catch him, flailing arms in futile desperation, faces grimacing wherever he bolted, whenever he bolted by them, left them all feeling his gusts busting their skin like a tonguing wind. He was a lightning strike. When it was all over, after he crossed the finish line, first, yes, again, flashed a laconic thousand watt smile, stuck his cock cocksure signature pose resembling a lightning boat, one arm cocked at the elbow from a bow up to God. It is the trademark victory strands worn by this apparel. Perhaps he thought of himself as a lightning boat. Yes, up in the sky, flashes we all viewed in our lifetime when he seduced us. Okay. This is poem uh, in Santo Domingo, and is dedicated to my uh, wife and the great uh, Cuban painter uh, Jose Bedia, who happened to be there. And this is what happened. This is what we saw. Flo was flew into Jose's Congo condo in San in San Dolio, Santo Domingo. Flew in through the open sliding doors, looking for whatever it was, only they knew, but they didn't seem to find whatever it was. So they start terrorizing me, buzzing all around my head, dive bumming like hornets, while I was eating breakfast, swooping down, making me flail my arms like windmills, scared to death, scared to death. Margaret. She just sat there, still as silence, ignoring those wasps hailing from backwoods, Gloucester, Mississippi. She was raised with them, knew them. But being from asphalt streets of St. Louis, Missouri, I kept on swatting at those buzzing little boogaboos, trying to kill them as fast as I could. But failing, fla failing at that, I got me a broom to smash the tiresome little annoyances when one got stuck up in the sticky glue of a spider's web. 
up on the ceiling, hanging upside down from a light bulb fixture. It started wiggling, spinning wildly around, but couldn't get loose as it hung up there like a lynched black man or a woman, buffeted by winds, blowing through open doors like a probing tongue. It, the breeze, kept the thing spinning around until it just died before the other three wasps came back to rescue him, it, whatever. Who knows? It was too late anyway. And th so they just kept on buzzing around up close, sniffing at the dangling dead one. For what? Though careful not to get too close themselves. To stick onto the deadly spider's gossamer glue, which meant certain death for them too. So that, so then the three seemed to go into deep mourning while flying around. That reminded me of trembling drunk people thumping, thump, thumping hard against the ceiling. Then they flew back down, looked again at their fallen comrade up there just spinning, no movement except the fluttering from time to time of its frail, transparent wings. And Margaret said, wasps must have emotions too. Made me feel sorry for the little dead wasp, the asshole for its friends, seemingly so inconsolable now in their mourning, bumping around like crazy up on the ceiling. That's when I put down my broom, vowed never to kill another wasp again unless they were trying to sting me. Then our old butts would be off, I told myself, because in a blink of an eye, I would go back to killing all of them little buzzing little boogaloos, boogaboos, in droves, just like the deranged, wild, swinging American fool I truly am at my core. That's true, you know, you, you, uh, you'd be swearing you ain't gonna do this again, and then you do. This is called Switching in the Kitchen. It's for my good friend, um, uh, Mildred Howard, who is not only a great artist, but a really great cook. She's really a great cook, and when Margaret and her get together, they be in the kitchen switching around. That's where the title came from. They be in there cooking and switching all through the house. I'd just be waiting for the food. <laughs> you know, I'll be waiting for the food. Switching in the kitchen after a show, art show of the same name by Mildred Howard. Rhythms be switching in kitchens when cooks work magic through pots. Out on the dance floors, hips gyrate like poets constructing lines, sometimes switch and drop from proper to colloquial. New days are forever changing color, weather. Voices switch back and forth up in the sky. Down here, breezes caress bodies, sashay through thoroughfares inside language, doing whatever flip-flops it has to, to survive. Inside music, everything matters. A poet steps off the count, syncopating syllables, meters. The voice music falls over the edge of a cliff of chromatic scales, shades splash bright clues uh, as water skedaddling, new diamond drops imitates flash flush birds, spraying syllables through showering waterfalls, mist scheming, skeening language skews, stretches, slips and slides through space, sounds crack, ensconced rapture somewhere here. Listen to these hair splitting Ruptures politicians spew every day in sad convergences of bad flat notes. As time signatures skip to my loo through lace, grace notes bloom in poetic lines, loom, post haste, push and zing the voices through sound, shimmy shango, shimmy shingo, shimmy shango, juxtapose in place, the poet's high energy gymnastics, hijack words, switch up in double backs, pivots, crossovers, 
as Skywalker's wind wing word plays deep beyond boundary lines where NBA gunners drop trays, pop cards, create balladic touche, body magic up inside rhyme schemes, rhapsodic, their body music reflects light as spirits lance curling through prismatic flights. Oh, tell me about it. Air Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, up there in lights, imitating bird, bebop, well, you needn't, because great solos are traceable at flights, Sun Ra and Coltrane, breathing solos as they zoom, riding hijink monk riffs into any rooms they play. I'll read about three more and sit down. Where have they all gone? These are my friends and people I grew, you know, was, uh, I was in the Watch Writers Workshop in California, Los Angeles, before coming east. And so these, these were some of my friends, uh, Ojinki, Eric Plesey, Eric Priestley and Kay Curtis Lau. We all were out there together being crazy. Uh, that's where I first started drinking wine up there. <laughs> with these fools, <laughs> you know. Where have they all gone? Where have they all gone to? Those exuberant, edgy misfits, those glorious madcap poets of precise inexactitude, those lunatic purveyors of transcendental flights through space, verbal hijinks, skywalkers, of jazzified hyperbolic scatology, rhapsodic sleepwalkers selling screaming Jay Hawkins woof tickets, echoing skull and bone dances of Dahomey voodoo smackdowns, emanating from beyond watery graves of middle passage, from the genocide of millions, all the spiritual six-fingered witch doctors brewing up revenge. Where have they gone to? Secreted deep in hidden holes of linguistic thoroughfares, those sacred red robe Wilt Chamberlain Messiah spiritual hunters who chased hunters of lions running free around Tanzania. I say, where have all the stark-legged soothsayer space cadets traveled to? Disciples of sunrise, bamboozling cloud bursts of words, those smoke signal purveyors of mojo, mojo, mojo language, hypnotizing through music, those schizophrenic soothsayers practicing bop the loop tom toms, rhythmic scavengers of esoteric metaphors stitched throughout knuckle headed sentences, illuminated by yard bird Parker excursions through solos, exploring outer limits of scatological space where Miles Davis used to go, the loneliest monk comp comping along as a coastal solo sidekick, riffing off only he knows what mysterious piano licks. Where have they all gone to? Those insane rollerblade skaters, decked out in silver asbestos suits and caps, wrap around shades, zooming, weaving, weaving through Manhattan traffic like Lone Ranger silver bullets. Those slingshot word magicians, loop guru wordsmiths, shooting out rhythms hidden deep in thickets of reared back cobra snake tongues who flick out hypnotic spells undulating spellbinding magic. Where have they gone to? Where have they all gone to? I don't sue them, see them riding anymore. <laughs> One more. Then we gonna sit down and talk? Okay. Chasing words and lines. This is the last one. This is with Tony Morrison. Tony Morrison was my editor at the uh, when I was when she was at Random House, 
And uh, we used to argue all the time. So people used, we would argue so loud, people used to come around and see if we was going to fight. <laughs> you know, we'd be arguing about all kind of stuff, you know. And, and then she'd stick their head in there. And she'd say, all right, just get away. Get, get, get out of here. Get, just get out of here. So I, I just loved Tony. She was such a beautiful spirit and such a great writer and editor, too, also. Chasing words and lines for Toni Morrison. I am dreaming, thinking of sluicing words structured into lines, stretching across pages. They remind of newborn bloody babies pulled from wounds of fecund imaginations. When poets chase metaphors, as painters, birth translate colors into rhythms, into rhythms of musicians, voices plucked from grapes, cluster in vines, find their places in fine wines on dinner tables. And they are shaped into contours of the world. They are echoes, seeds popping from the ground as flowers, Memories stitched through poems as words, lyrics, songs of Bono, or leaps of faith as in deep, so, so, so deep narratives sewn into our lives inside Toni Morrison's books, her sentences or blues, underlining broken shards, razor sharp as jazz, and they will cut you badly, cut you badly if you're not ready to hear the show enough truth. But there is sweetness here, too, in Tony's blues, her vision full of grace beyond happenstance. It's a fertile place tracing America's history, shaped by bloodletting firing squads of race to lay one's head down onto a pillow and listen to the truth defining falsehoods. Some historians serve up on forked tongues, laced with cyanide and race-baiting narratives. But Tony cut through all that duplicitous bullshit with a voice clear as a, sword's, as a sword's beheading fools. In her works of fiction, essays, and public speeches, she once said, quote, art is dangerous and left no doubt who she was listening to, Miles Davis, Angela, Ange, Angela Davis, John Coltrane, William Faulkner, Gabriel Garcia Marcus, Lucille Clifton, Tony Cade Bambara, Ella Fitzgerald, Jimmy Baldwin, Amiri Baraka, the Silver Glove, Glove, the Silver Glove Wizard, Henry Dumas, Sonia Sanchez, Streets voices she grew up listening to in Lorraine, Ohio, the down home language of black women fixing hair in the kitchens, black beauty parlor Sundays, Saturdays, Sunday morning go to church, hand clapping rituals, shouting out the gospel of laying on of hands in sacred river baptismal ceremonies serving as doorways for initiates to pass through, to kiss and greet spiritual ancestors in white robes. It's where your spirit, Toni Morrison, just flew to now, accompanied by hand clapping, singing black choirs, belting out hallelujahs and praise be to your name, while cooing birds trill lines of your prose, flapping wings, and then we heard the words, excelsior, excelsior, excelsior. Thank you. Am I supposed to sit down? That was wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for walking us through a little bit of what this uh, magnificent collection of poems, 1966 to now, with its great implication that there are more poems to come. Yeah. Uh, writing every day. 
Yeah. Um, for those of you who are worried about the time, we started a little late, so we have just about five minutes, so um, we can ask Quincy some questions. I know from Quincy our... Quincy wants water. Oh, yeah, I have some water. I know from our conversation that you, as you said when you were um, out in California, but likewise when you were in St. Louis running around before you got serious about literature, when you got serious about literature, who were some of the writers that you were finding in that time? <clears throat> well, my, my largest influence um, has always been Pablo Neruda. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he was just my big influence. Uh, I, loved, uh, I, loved, uh, I loved the way he wrote. I loved, um, I loved the music. I loved the metaphors, the images. I, I, I could, I had never, uh, I couldn't imagine those kind of metaphors and images. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and until I read him. I always, I, you know, I love Gene Toomer also, uh, uh, Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. They were like great for me. I, I, yeah, I loved uh, Ralph Ellison. Ralph Ellison didn't love many people, but you know, <laughs> I did love Invisible Man. Yeah. You know, and I used to tease him all the time. You know, say, well, when are you gonna write that next book, bro? <laughs> <laughs> He'd get mad, he would get mad with me. You know. A lot of people teased him about that. Uh, you did? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those people, and um, I love Gene Toomer. I love Gene Toomer. Um, um, there were so many people. I love William Faulkner. Yeah. You know, um, um, yeah, those are some. It's, it's, uh, I find it fascinating that you gravitated certainly early on to a writer that was not this country's kind of American, but a different kind of American, writing in a different language with a different yeah. uh, geography in, in his space. You mean Marcus? I'm, I'm meaning Neruda. 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 And you got to meet Neruda when he came to New York. Yeah, I yeah. did. I, Neruda was, um, was a wonderful uh, spirit for me. Mm. And uh, I never thought I would meet Pablo Neruda. I, ne I, never, I never thought I would meet Garcia Marcus. You know, I just never thought I'd meet those people, you know. Uh, I was a basketball player uh, growing up, and, and like I said, uh, a person of the streets, you know, <laughs> to tell the truth in St. Louis. Um, and uh, my mother didn't think I was going to live that long because I was too <laughs> crazy, you know, <laughs> you know, out there, you know. Uh, I'm glad she, uh, you know, she was always on me. Mm. My mother was. She always read books, and she had books around the house. That's why I started reading books, because she had books around the house. And uh, my mother was a great little lady, you know, five feet two, and she wouldn't mind smacking you. <laughs> or, or, you know, you know, she used to come into my room, my brother and I, who was at one time became a great jazz musician, played with Lou Rawls and a lot of people, but we'd do some stupid stuff, and our bed, our, our room was off over here, and she, she would wait until after midnight, and she'd come with the ironing card. No. And we'd be in there naked, <laughs> sleeping. And then we look up and say, the light would come on to you. And I look up and see you. <laughs> She's coming down on us with the iron cord all across our back. So, so did any of that strict discipline filter into your writing practice? Uh, not that, but the just, I mean, I, <laughs> I listened to her. You know, she'd tell me not to do something. I you would wouldn't do it. do it. You know what I mean? Because I knew I had to go to sleep that night. Right, right. And right. I couldn't hit her. You know what I mean? <laughs> I couldn't hit her because my dad, who was... Even though they'd broke up, he'd come out there and beat me up, see? You know, mm -hmm. so I didn't, that was, that was useless, you know? So, but she taught me a lot. She taught me a lot. She was a wonderful woman. She loved Margaret. Her and, her and Toni Morrison were the two women, and I always say this, because I, I used to go out with a lot of women at one time. And, um, it, you know, that's what I did, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and Toni knew that. Uh -huh. And Toni knew, Morrison knew that. So... Toni Morrison said to me one day, Quincy, she had met Margaret, and she said, you know, she the one, what you running from? Mm. She's the one, not the rest of them. Right. It's her. Yeah. I was like, pissed. I don't want to get in your business. I said, well, you are in my business, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you already in my business. She said, well, I'm sorry, but that's the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. But she was right, though. Yeah. She was right. I uh, came to your work uh, it, about 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and I can't remember who it was, but somebody came into the old Cave Conum offices, and it might have been Terrence Hayes. It might have been Terrence Hayes, 
and you had published an interview with him, I think, in Yusuf Komenyaka, mm -hmm, in Black, mm -hmm. Renaissance, Black Renaissance Noir. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had never heard of you. And mm -hmm. so I guess I was talking to Terrence. I said, oh, yeah, you should check him out. He's a poet. He's one of the old cats from the 70s. Fine. Yeah. And your most recent book at the time, and I'll talk to you about this, your most recent book at that time was Trans Circularities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Trans Circularities is a new and selected poems, but it was, uh, it was I don't big. know, maybe it was big, but it was about two thirds of this size. And I had never seen um, a new book of poetry like that, because I guess I was new to sort of reading poetry seriously. But I, I have that book, and um, the center of the book for me is the poem uh, Trans Circularities. And uh, there's a line from it that I remember. Uh, that our language is a copy of a copy mm -hmm. of a copy. And that always stuck with me because it, I don't know who, I, who else I was reading at that time, but it, it struck me as vastly different and deeply philosophical, that mm -hmm. poem in mm -hmm. that book mm -hmm. and the structure and the, the, mm -hmm. the gravity of that book. And I, I want to know, I, I suppose I want to know where you were in your writing career at that point, because it's a, it's a poem that is absent of some of your other signature, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some of your other, the signature characteristics mm -hmm. of your poem. Well, you know, I, after I discovered Neruda, I, I don't know if I said it, but, and, and Gene Toomer, I discovered uh, Henry Dumas. Mm. I, I, I discovered Henry Dumas, and I was like, man, this guy is amazing. He's just amazing. You know, he's just, I, I was astonishing, I, I just thought. You know, um, and I used to read his work a lot. I used to read his work a lot. So uh, Henry, but he was dead, you know, mm -hmm. so I couldn't get a chance to meet him. Uh, but, uh, but, but Eugene Redman knew him. Yeah. And I used to bug Eugene all the time. I used to tell me about him, tell me about Henry Dumas, tell me about Henry Dumas. And, uh, 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 you know, so H Henry Dumas was a very important poet for me mm, also. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was a very important poet for me. And uh, <clears throat> so I always go back and look at his work still, you know, to this day. Uh, I still go back and look at I still look at Neruda. I still look at uh, uh, César Vallejo, the Peruvian poet. Mm. You know, I, I don't know why I like these odd poets. You know, they're not odd. They're, they're, they're the good they, ones. They, they, they are odd to a lot of people. <laughs> Some people's man. I turned this guy, a friend of mine who was a poet, onto César Vallejo, and he said, "Man, that guy is out." <laughs> I said, "What does that mean?" I can't get into none of that shit. I can't. I can't. What is he Indian? I said, <laughs> I said "Yeah, he's Indian." He said, "I can't." You know, you know. But I, I wish I could. Um, I could talk to you a lot about this for hours and hours. Henry Dumas, in particular, uh, there's a uh, his collected poems have recently been yeah. reissued. You mentioned Eugene Redman. Eugene Redman was in several of the images that you saw there. His daughter mm -hmm. is a Cave Canem fellow. Yeah, uh, Eugene di uh, Dumas died very young, but the, he left such an impression on other poets because all these decades later, people like yourself, people like Jay Wright. Are right. still talking about and, and Eugene Redman are still right. are still talking about him, um, but sadly, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to have to That's ask okay. you just one last question okay. um, for the people who are in the room and also for the people who are watching in their own homes. Um, if you had to, if you were really forced and pinned down to say one one thing of importance about the art form of poetry, what would you say to us? Well, I can only say it for myself. Um, uh, what it meant to me, uh, because I always read. My mother had, like I said, she had books around the house, but she never had any poets. Mm. She didn't have any poets around the house. She didn't have any of that. And so when I discovered poetry, when I discovered poetry, it was like, and that's going to be sound. It's going to sound strange, uh, but it was the same thing, same way I felt when I discovered basketball. You know, I mean, when I discovered that I could play basketball, and I love basketball. You know, my father wanted me to be a baseball player. And I was really, I had a 92-mile-hour 90, 90, fastball. And he thought I could make the major leagues. He thought I could make the major leagues. And my father was a scout for the St. Louis Cardinals. And he had told everybody about me being this 
guy with this fastball, and I could throw curves because my dad was a great baseball catcher. So he taught me. And I remember I said, I don't want to be no baby. And then I, no, oh, that's what it was. I went to one of them Cardinal games and one of them black players games, and they, was, they, were, they were trying to snuff, I mean, chewing tobacco <laughs> and spitting them, spitting it in those little, you know. And I was hip at that time. I mean, I was in the clothes, styling and all that. I couldn't see myself spitting no chewing tobacco in no pot. <laughs> I just could not. I said, I can't do this shit. I cannot do that. I don't want to be around nobody who does that, yeah. you know. And I, I was around all them baseball players, and that's what they were doing, chewing, chewing, and chewing, chewing, chewing putting so spitting you in swapped, the pot. So you swapped it out. For I said, I'm out. Okay. I'm out of that. I can't do it, Dad. I can't do this. And he said, Junior, Junior, you can make the major leagues. You ain't got to be. You got. I said, Dad, I can't do it. He was mad with me. He was mad with me for a long time, mm. you know. But I was, I was serious. I said, I, I didn't know I was going to be a poet. I just didn't until I started reading. And, I, and, I, and it, when I... When I discovered Pablo Neruda, when I discovered Pablo Neruda, and then I discovered John Joseph Rabia Ravello, uh-huh. John Joseph Rabia Ravello, uh, those kind of poets, they just took me out. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. took my imagination out. Um, and they still have a big influence. So that's, that's what it is, you know. Um, um, you know, you know, Margaret is one of the, you know, most women, uh, the women I was going with, they were like, Oh, are you still reading them weird poems? You know what? You know, they come over my house. But Margaret's never said that. Right. She, she never said anything like that to me. So never. when you discover an exuberance of, of poetry, follow it, and it brings wonderment into your life. That's what you're saying. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so you much. I'm glad you turned to poetry. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to Margaret for Thank you for so much supporting yeah. all of this wonderful work. I just have a few, uh, a few words of thanks. Um, what started as a cohort of 26 writers uh, 27 years ago uh, has now grown into a fellowship of 500. Um, for the fellows and faculty who are here with us uh, this afternoon, your many contributions to the field, the art of letters, and our communities cannot be overstated, so I thank you for that. Um, I also want to take this time to acknowledge all the people who donate to Kaveh Kahnem in support of this event. Uh, special thanks to Kaveh Kahnem's co-founder, Toy Derekot and Cornelius Eady, our staff and board of directors led by our president, Tayem Bajess. Uh, thank you uh, to AWP, especially to Colleen Cable and to Claire Johnson. Thank you to uh, Michael Ferguson at LMG and to our ASL interpreters. This program is supported in part by uh, the Amazon Literary Partnership Poetry Fund in partnership with the Academy of American Poets, Ford Foundation, Heinz Endowment for the Arts, Lennon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, and the Rona Jaffe Foundation. Uh, If you're not already on our mailing list, please be sure to visit uh, us at www.kavekanampoets.org, uh, where you can sign up and stay abreast of all the exciting developments that we do in support of black poetry. We look forward to you joining us on Monday, April 24th, for the Derricott Edie Prize reading with Meredith Inoka and Herman Beavers. Uh, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your night and conference and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>